All right. So my name is Tori. I'm here for our online world of learning and I am here. I'm a music therapist and I am here with Chezzy and Mike. So Chezzy, why don't you give a little bit of background about who you are and what you do? Awesome. Hi, Tori. Hi, Mike. Um, so as Tori mentioned, um, Chessy, I'm also a board certified music therapist. I am an international student from Venezuela. Um, and I came here to the US about almost six years ago to study music therapy at Temple University. And now I'm studying clinical mental health counseling at Villanova University. Great. Mike? My name's Mike Mahoney. I am a music therapist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I've been working there for about nine years now, um, and I, well, that's my whole story. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the great things about being able to use this forum to interview is that even in the age of COVID-19, we can still get together, right? Yeah. Yes. So um, for the, for the, our patrons of World of Online, uh, online world of learning. We just want to highlight the things about this profession, what brought you to this profession, um, what kind of educational institutions that people can look into, ones that you, um, you're, you have attended or are attending presently, um, what kind of competencies, some obstacles, and then hopefully to leave with some pe leave some people with great resources as well. So let's start, um, and either one of you can go um, whenever you are ready. But what brought you, what brought you to this profession? Um, were there did you have any influences or uh, resources that you had been able to tap into that kind of brought you this way, or life experiences? Any anything that brought you here? There's no right answer. Or wrong answer. I can start. Um, so I I started playing violin and from a young age in Venezuela um, with El Sistema. It's a, a big orchestra um, system in Venezuela. So I started playing violin. Um, I was also very interested in like ecology and, and human nature and human connection. Um, so when it came the time to to pick a major, well, well, or pick a school, or, or decide what to do. Um, I I always had a very clear that I wanted to come here to the U.S. To study, and um, I was looking at maybe double majoring in music and psychology, looking at my options. Um, Temple University happened to like pop up in my in my searches, and and then pointed music therapy out. Um, so when I started doing the research about it, it just clicked. So much it made so much sense to me um also during that time that i was uh picking universities and and on the process to get here to the u.s my younger brother got diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. and uh, we used music as a resource of connection and as a coping skill and and that was really our source of joy through such a difficult time it was also a really difficult time politically in our country a lot of protests on the streets. It was a, a really difficult time and, and us being able to make music together was so cathartic, so healing, um, that from that moment I was like, there's there's something here. I, I wanna be able to to bring this to other people, this this sense of, of catharsis and, and joy that I'm getting here with my family and my brother. I wanna be able to provide that for other kids and family. So that was kind of like my my pushing force, um, and and then fast forward four years later, I was work um, doing my internship at Chubb with Mike, um, mainly in the oncology unit. So, so yeah, that's kind of what brought me here and in, in into the music therapy world. That's fantastic. Um, for me, I had uh, completed a four-year bachelor degree. Um, without any connection to music or psychology. Mm -hmm. um, I had a philosophy degree with a business studies minor and I was working a lot with my campus radio station. Um, I used um, some of the connections that I had made at the radio station um, to parlay into a, a, a short 
uh, career as a music business person in New York City. Um, I found that I did not enjoy that the way that I expected to. Mm-hmm. And um, after, after about four years in New York, I started thinking about what I would really want to do in the long term. And um, I thought about really two things. Um, I thought about my time as a a camp counselor at a summer camp working with kids. And I thought about how much I enjoy um, the satisfaction and the rewards of making music um, on my own and with my friends really as the main um, mode of making music. I I had played in the school band um, as a elementary schooler and and high school uh, student but that wasn't my interest the the formal like reading music off a page wasn't my interest nearly as much as um, just the 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 music making with other people in a spontaneous way and and we could be creative and have fun together Um, my my mother-in-law was working at the uh, va hospital the the hospital for veterans in buffalo new york Uh, she told me about the music therapist who was coming to their facility and thought that it would be a really good fit for me. So I started looking at different programs and the program that I found that was a good fit for me was at uh, the master's program at Drexel University. Um, That worked well for me because that program is not based out of a music school. It's, It's based out of a college of nursing and health professions. So it didn't require me to earn a music degree and spend years playing in ensembles and, and uh, chamber groups and, and becoming a really classically excellent <laughs> musician. That just wasn't my interest. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did the program at Drexel and it was two years. I, I got a lot out of it and really enjoyed my time there and, and then was lucky to get the position at, at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia about six months after I graduated. That's really cool too. Thanks. Perfect. So you guys have very different backgrounds of getting to the same place professionally, even at least at some point, um, which I think happens. I, I've heard a lot of stories talking with people about having their own experiences with some kind of illness or sick family, family member, um, and they happen to be musician as well, but have this other part of themselves that, you know, either wants to help or is a little analytical. And so they kind of like to see the application of music in some kind of uh, human perspective or process. And then I've also heard stories where people are in a completely different profession, maybe have kind of touched into the music professional world on some level, but um, that avenue of the profession just wasn't satisfying some kind of deeper purpose that they felt that they needed in their life. And they somehow through their own research, you know, or somebody telling them like Mike about somebody else doing this work, think, you know, then they are exposed to it and think, oh, maybe, maybe this could be for me. And then they dive right in. Mm-hmm. So, and I'm sure there's a whole other avenue of people getting um, kind of introduced or pipelined into this kind of profession. Um, so, what, speaking of the kind of you getting into the, the beginnings of it, Mike, you touched on a little bit of what drew you to your educational institution. That's the next question. Mm. Um, but if there's more, feel free to divulge or Chesi, what really brought you to Temple? You said you kept seeing it, but what kind of attracted you to finally make that big step? Because you just didn't, you know, choose a school in a different state. You, you chose to, you know, (laughs) travel to a whole nother country. So there's, there had to have been a pretty good pool to Temple University. Yeah. Yeah. Um, As I was saying, it, it, it kept showing up on, on every search that I was doing. I had, When I was um, thinking about coming here to study uh, in a university, I had my list of requirements I wanted Mm -hmm. from a university. I wanted to be in a big city where the music scene was big, where I could go to an orchestra concert, where I could 
meet a lot of musicians that I really wanted to. And also I am from Caracas, which is the capital of Venezuela. It's a big city. I wanted to be in a big city. Um, so Temple kept showing up. Also all the interactions I had with with faculty and administration of Temple was really, really positive. They even connected me with another music student who was Venezuelan and also played violin. Um, also this, I, I don't think I've ever seen in every other, any other university, but they had an amazing virtual tour, which was really, really helpful because I wasn't able to come or tour universities or do anything in person. So mm -hmm. through that virtual tour, I kind of felt like I was here in a way and, and gave me a feeling for it. And, and when I was looking at the music therapy program and the classes that I would be taking, every single class, I could picture myself being so happy taking those classes. Mm. I was just like, this is made for me. I was just so excited to start taking those classes. Um, so yeah, and also I think just the vibe of Temple, it has a really large international population. Mm -hmm. um, it, it works out in many ways. And so were you happy in those classes when you took those classes were you as happy as you thought <laughs> I was there's some maybe I wasn't so happy in some of the music theory classes at times or some of the other requirements but but the core music therapy classes exceeded my expectations oh that's great yeah I I would imagine that um not a ton of music therapists love music theory because we're very practical many music therapists say what a they went how, okay so how do I apply this right so if you're not if you're not thinking of how you can, you know, make it into like bring it to life, it mm. can be a little frustrating, a little mm -hmm. frustrating to to sit in in those classes. But they end up being worth it in the end. Yeah, just usually it's like later you're like, oh, you pull from something <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay, fine. I guess it made sense. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, what about you? Besides the fact that Drexel is part of you know, College of Nursing or whatever, which that is really interesting. Let's talk a little bit about that too. Mm -hmm. um, and the differences between, let's hear the differences between Chesie's um, experience getting into. I wonder if the competencies or the application process was a little bit different for you going into like a, it was, it's under the college, like the School of Music in Temple, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so let's, let's see if that's different. So we'll go to Mike and what drew you besides kind of the scope or, or what it was umbrellaed under? Um, you know, it, it felt like a, a nice fit for a person who did not have a lot of the formal experiences as a classically trained musician. Hmm. Um, I, I had some, you know, I had to come in audition using a primary instrument and I, I used a, I did some snare drum solos um, having, yes. having done that. Uh, in high school, and um, and it was okay, but but I did communicate to um, my future academic advisor that mm -hmm. I, I sort of had to dust off the 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 pieces sure. and and the I had my drum set, so I pulled the snare drum out of my drum set and <laughs> lifted up the um, the height so I could stand next to it. Um, you know that just wasn't my regular my regular thing. Um, I had to learn, you know, other than understanding rhythms, um, I bought music theory for dummies mm. um, or the complete idiot's guide to music theory, whatever, you know, whatever it was called. <laughs> and I pretty much read the whole thing all the way through mm -hmm. um, as part of the application process, because I knew that I'd be asked about things, um, certain kinds of chords and notation that had always yeah. been mysterious to me, okay. even even though I had taken some piano lessons as a younger person, um, I had just learned what notes to play in what order and not really understood how to make sense of it. So I enjoyed it on that basic level and was able to hang enough to get through some really simple right. um, tasks. Um, those things included playing a simple folk song that I didn't already know how to play, but figuring it out right then and there in the audition. Um, having, having a piece where I would sing and play guitar, having a piece where I would sing and play the piano um, with the understanding that it's not expected for every new student to be an expert level um, 
player. You know, you're not applying to a music school. You're applying to show that you have the potential to use this in a clinical setting. And, and the demands for that person are much different than the demands for a person mm -hmm. performing a concert in a theater. Yeah. So what was your, did you have to audition, Chessie? Yeah, I, I had to take my cell phone and violin and, and send those those auditions to the music school. Mm -hmm. um, I now I'm thinking, I don't know if maybe domestic students had to play something different for like a specific music therapy audition. I don't think so. I think it, it was just like general music school admission. Yes. Um, they weren't us expecting uh, weren't expecting us to to know how to play the piano or guitar or sing right away. Even those were things that that were part of the curriculum, and we had to learn after. But we weren't expected to to know them. So you just had to have your primary instrument, which mine, as I mentioned, was violin, because because you do then have to be part of orchestra or a choir. Um, it is a little more heavy on the music um, things than than the masters. Okay. Okay. So how was it then to, you know, because there might be some people that are seeing this that don't play guitar or piano. So how was it being a proficient musician somewhere other than that and then having to start all over again with these other instruments? I can say for myself that um, I was with a group of 10 students total in my class mm -hmm. at Drexel. We got to know each other really well and, and formed a really strong sort of group relationship together. Mm -hmm. And the expectation was never that everyone should be at a super high level and, and that some people were really learning to play this instrument for the very first time. Mm -hmm. um, myself, I did very well in our course on technology once we got to that and I was yeah. helping the other students yeah. uh, with their projects. But then when it was time for piano class, then I had a lot of other people giving me advice. Um, I'm, I'm a self-taught guitar player, so I was kind of in the middle on the guitar mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and able to show some of the brand new guitarists some things um, while still having a lot to learn myself. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the kind of environment, you know, a, a room full of future therapists is going to be hopefully pretty forgiving mm -hmm. if you're not just absolutely perfect in your performance skills. You know, you're really learning to play for a room of people for different purposes other than impressing them with your perfect music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is a great way to put it, Mike. The, just having that supportive environment full of therapists to be really, really helps. Um, I, I didn't, I hadn't sat in front of a piano before I, I put it, I, I got to Temple. So, so that was challenging. I thought that maybe a little level that they were expecting of us was slightly higher than somebody that doesn't know how to play piano at all. Um, it was a little easier with the guitar. They did start with, with more basics and, and the the name of the class is like it was besides like guitar one, guitar two, and then it's functional guitar. So as Mike says, like they already tell you that it's not like you're trying to learn these things to impress people or to be able to perform in front of a giant cloud in order to get to a functional level. So yes. I think that was also reassuring in a way, even with the title of the class. Um, and and that was kind of like the approach that our professors were showing. At the end of the four years, we did have to take this big exam. Um, to prove our proficiency, yeah. um, but but at the entry level it was it was challenging but but doable. I think once you have uh, this primary instrument and some knowledge about it, music and music theory, it's easier to pick up the other instruments. It's true. Yeah, I've talked to another violinist who you know who went into music therapy and said it was much easier to pick up the guitar because it's another stringed instrument. Like your, your fingers are used to kind of yeah. making, you know, those types of shapes and, and holding, you know, an instrument in that regard. But then piano is like, so, so far. And like, um, and it's funny cause I, I didn't realize how, you know, how much people did have other people had, cause you're, you know, you just so focus on yourself. I, had played piano, you know, 
my whole life and was a singer and decided to teach myself guitar in high school. And so I was like, don't I, shouldn't I get a little bit more instruction? They're like, you're fine. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I feel like I, I wanted a little bit more instruction than I was, that I was actually getting at some, at some points. Um, but then once you get into the field, you realize it's really about function. It's not, it's not as much about performance. Um, there is some level of performance, right? Just because, but there's some level of performance in speaking if you're in talk therapy as well, like of being mindful of how you're saying things and what you're doing, um, but definitely not to the level that other students in other majors in the School of Music would be required um, mm -hmm. to do. And that's the other thing that I hear a lot too, um, just being a professor of other music therapy students is, everybody's much more forgiving of each other and it's not a comp you, there's just you're all in the boat and you're all freaking out so much there's no competition it's <laughs> you're just you're just trying to survive you're just you know how do you yeah. how do you make that chord you know mm -hmm. <laughs> they're all jumping in oh you do it like this you know or there's right. several ways to do something so that's really really nice so if anybody's you know anybody watching this is interested or you're not sure you're a little bit nervous hopefully um hearing these accounts make it less scary for for them so um what let's let's go into so we the competencies for everybody is very similar musically and and like what is required i do want to ask you tazzy was there something that you had was there a competency that you had to fulfill with your language at all was there anything that you felt like you had to do differently than somebody who was already from the states yeah well as part of the admission requirements to the university in general i did have to take the TOEFL exam to prove my proficiency in english and um, something that that they didn't require um or, or said anything about it but that was something that i had to drastically change and relearn on my own was fixed though like with um with uh, sausage and, and yeah. music theory yeah that was just i think the rest of the world including Venezuela <laughs> uses thick dough and the U.S. uses movable dough, which it's almost like a different language sometimes mm -hmm. it feels like. Um, so, so to be able to like communicate the music language that you already know, um, it, like it, it can be really frustrating because you know it, but you're not able to communicate it the same way. So even like the exams, like you're like, okay, I know, but, but I'm just not to like, translate everything not only from Spanish to English but to this music language that I know to this other music language um, so even though that wasn't a requirement that's something that I wish I would have known at least to to start learning it and, and preparing from earlier on instead of having to just jump in right. and figure out in the same class while trying to get good grades <laughs> yeah yeah because music is supposed to be the universal language right like we all perceive it the exact same way no no we don't no. right so there's other there are other cultures that have even more tones like we go from an eight tone scale you know and there's other you know let's say somebody's watching this from more eastern Eastern countries that have more tones, you know, they just utilize more tones. Mm -hmm. Their experience in US school, music theory wise, or just being able to communicate musically, it's gonna be very, very different. Their song choices are gonna be very different and their mm -hmm. ear training is gonna be so, so different because yes. of that. You know, so we know that we are patterned musically from a very young age, that there's ways, there's just like any other, you know developmental process there is a music developmental process so you pretty much were like thrown back into like you know musical development you know <laughs> but you were being taught as if you were you know a, 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 an older teenager or or an, a young adult knowing this and being exposed to it your whole life whereas you were just like your brain was just absorbing it as if a, you know a baby would but but not being taught on a developmentally appropriate level, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. Right. So how did you manage that? Like, did you, did people help you? Did you talk to professors about it? Did they understand it? Did they even realize that that is a thing? Um, yeah. Uh, so definitely I, I let her, my professors know um, that was 
something that was important to me for, for them to know. Also my classmates, as, as Mike was saying, like same as the, they jump in to help in the guitar class, they, they also in, in a way jump to help here. Um, but it, honestly, most of it was just me having to sink or swim to drill it in my brain, like try to study more and more outside of class. It was, yeah, there was a lot of just like inner work of trying to even like playing in the piano because that's the other thing that like when you grow up for for so many years playing music and your A is la and it has a specific sound in your head that you're hearing it all your life tuning the violin, it's, it's kind of hard to, to change your brain, like retrain it to, okay, no, it doesn't sound like this and this different key. So it was also like right. sitting on a piano and like playing different things and or writing. It was a lot of just outside work by myself too. So la could be do, depending on right. where you want to start. Yeah, which yeah. was really confusing for me. <laughs> what what um what do you what could you like what do you think that your professors could have done like looking back what do you think that they could have done to help you Whew, that's a good question i feel like usually we're asked to figure out on ourselves rather than tell people what they can do to help us like that um i mean i think I mean, it wouldn't be fair to to ask them to also like do the translation for for me with the big so to the I think just like a little bit more time and and grace in those beginning like first weeks of the semester. Um, I mean, it's it's not like I wa I would have wanted to ask to to be uh, for them to be more lenient and give me better grades than I deserved or anything, but I think maybe just like some flexibility and an understanding, at least in the beginning. Um, yeah. I know that, that sometimes they do offer to take a whole semester of like the pre-music theory. Um, so that could also be a, an option for people um, if they could afford that extra semester and they feel that they would feel more comfortable just learning very basic things mm -hmm. um, to get used to that new language. Um, I, I did take some music theory classes before, so I was just like so stubborn and like, and, and I couldn't afford to spend that extra semester as well. Right. Um, so I also like put it on me to just try to get on the harder class and, and do it. But I think definitely, yeah, just communicating that to professors and asking for, for flexibility and understanding at the beginning maybe could have been helpful. Yeah. So I think if there's, if you're a professor watching this, I think it's really important to understand that people are coming from different backgrounds. And um, what I'm getting from this myself is, you know, just knowing that that could be a possibility um, for a future student. Um, and I think if you are a professor, you would, I mean, one of the things that kind of would draw you to be something, you know, in that profession on some level is to know things. <laughs> <laughs> just to know stuff and things and um, to have that to have that knowledge that there are those other especially as a music therapy professor to know that there are other ways of experience music and and perceiving and understanding and processing music on a neurological level because that's really what it is at this point it could be really really valuable because just because it could be your student and it you might think it's like an isolated experience it could you could always have that um, experience with a client or patient someday mm -hmm. so always have to be thinking about that so Mike you probably I don't know what's your what's your reaction to this for you as a clinician now I well um, in my limited music theory background, I'll admit that the first time I heard the word solfege was mm. in our second semester like, is that piano a brunch? class. Is that on a brunch menu? Yeah. yeah. It, I was, everyone was saying this word that just sounded so weird to my ears. I didn't, I had literally never heard the word before. Um, <laughs> I am learning as Jesse is speaking now about fixed dough in other countries, which I had no idea about that's so interesting to me mm -hmm. um and i'm i'm just appreciative of the learning experience of finding out about how other people understand and hear music differently than i would with my with my american ear <laughs> yeah 
Thank you. So that really, like, I would, did not even expect anything like that to come up, to be honest with you. Yeah. We're, um, do you, so do you think my, I was going to go into my next thing was like your biggest obstacle. Was that your biggest obstacle for, do you think for your, for your education regarding education or, or even entering? So we can, let's, let's move through there. So what was your biggest obstacle either in your education or, and, or depending on how you want to answer the question, I'm open to all of it. Um, or your biggest obstacle entering the field? Um, I can offer that when I graduated, um, that was in August of 2010, when I graduated with my music therapy, creative arts and therapy degree. Mm -hmm. um, there was a limited number of music therapy positions available in the field. Yeah. yeah. Um, my strategy was to send messages to everyone that I had crossed paths with during my education who had, who had worked with children or um, was currently working with children to find out about open positions. And some people got back to me. Um, I got a position right away working like just a few hours a week at a creative arts center outside of Philadelphia. Um, so that was a great start, but it certainly wasn't paying you know, rent and, you know, monthly food amounts of money. Or your student loans. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, and so it was, I think for me, a big challenge was just waiting for an, a position to come along that had enough hours um, that, uh, you know, that, that I could have a career. I was really lucky that that came along in about six months. I, I, I had a part-time position at the hospital where I am now full-time. Mm -hmm. um, the same week, I happened to start another one-day position somewhere else. So I was at three different places, which I think is very common for a lot of new music therapists to yeah. gather up a um, kind of a small amount mm -hmm. or a, a large amount of small hour jobs and hope that yeah. they grow. Yeah. Um, I also, um, I was limited in having like limited access to a car. So mm -hmm. that was holding me back a lot as well. And only being able to take positions that I could access with uh, public transportation. Mm. Yeah. Which I would think that's probably more common than people realize. Yeah, living in the city, it's not always the expectation that you need to have a car. And if you right. can get by without it, then you try to get by without it. Right. Right. Tezzy, what about you? Yeah. Um, so in the program entering, uh, one of the biggest obstacles, I think, was learning music. And <laughs> to be honest, is like cultural music um because and i fell behind and compared to my classmates because everybody grows up here listening to folk songs to children's songs um yes. to, and they already like they already have this like built-in music bank mm -hmm. just by living in this country um so that that is really an advantage when you're like trying to learn those songs from guitar and piano and and like I start having sessions with people and, and already know like, okay, yes, I, I do remember that song from when I was little and my dad sang it to me, things like that. Um, I didn't have that. Um, I mean, American culture is <laughs> like, it, it transmits worldwide. So, so to some extent, I did have some knowledge of music, but just re like, I feel just starting that groundwork of, of learning all the, all the music was one of the biggest obstacles. Um, similar to Fix, though, it was a lot of like just work on my own to to kind of catch up to the way that things are done here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Even even with like children's songs, like with Mike, like I had to like ask him a lot of a lot of music um, because I had this the music that I grew up with, but I wasn't sure if maybe there were some more that I didn't even know about. Um, so There's definitely a lot of asking. Um, a lot of classmates and, and professors for sheet music, for playlists, for a lot of things like that. Yeah. Um, and then entering the field, um, 
similar to what Mike said, um, it is challenging to find a full-time music therapy job right after graduation. There are limited spots. And, and then being an international student, there's the added barrier that I, am, I can't just take any job. Um, it has to be something related to music therapy. Well, first, um, after graduation, you have to apply for something called OPT, which is op Optional Practicum Training. Okay. Um, and with that, it, um, it gives you a 12-month uh, permit to work legally in the U.S. under the conditions that you are working in your field. So I couldn't have possibly taking like a part-time job in music therapy for a day or two right. and then work waitress or, or do anything yeah. else. Um, so, and there's also the requirement that you have to be working at least 20 hours a week. Um, and to be honest, I mean, I, I needed to be working the 40 hours a week to sure. be able to, to sustain myself. Um, so that was extremely challenging, to be honest, and, and very stressful to, to be able to find a job with those requirements. Um, and, and I also couldn't afford to, to move home um, and rely on my family or my parents for a little bit while I found that, uh, that job. Um, so I found myself having to jump in kind of quickly to a, a job in a nursing home that wasn't music therapy the 40 hours. It was kind of like activity assistance with yeah. music therapy embedded in it right um so it wasn't also what it was ideal what it was i hoping for after four and a half years of music therapy education but that was the compromise i had to take based on uh, just being an international student trying to stay in this country with a job um it ended up having a lot of positive things and i learned a lot of music for that population and yeah. and it was really cool to to develop my skills that way but it was definitely very challenging getting out of school and, and finding that job and so how long were you at that at that um setting i was there for about nine months because then i i i had to like reevaluate what were going to be my next uh my next steps that of work permit was rapidly expiring yeah because it's 12 months long <laughs> yeah yeah so so then i applied for graduate school so that's what i'm doing now and i'm getting my master's in clinical mental health counseling that's great um and how do you see that how do you see those things working together in your future yeah i mean my so uh when I was a, a job doing the internship with Mike, I, I noticed that I, sometimes I would go into sessions and maybe it was, for example, with a baby. So I, I was so comfortable working with this baby, but then when, I, when it came time to talk with mom, I, I would be like, okay, I don't really know what to do. Like, you know, and you have your instinct and your therapeutic disposition and everything, but I didn't feel like I had all of the skills that I really wanted. To be able to to do that verbal processing, so that's kind of why why I wanted to to go into counseling, and it's been really great to like be able to to bring all the training and all the knowledge I have about music therapy and about connecting with people through through music and nonverbals and all of these things and build and report in a in a different way, and and I feel like they're just complementing so well, and now I can think of things that I'm learning there in counseling that maybe I could have implemented in music mm. therapy sessions. Mm -hmm. um, so my hope is to be able to, to be able to combine these two things and be flexible with my yes. clients. Like if somebody wants a, a session of music therapy and then we stop and talk and process some things mm -hmm. um, or something more, you know, like be able to, to be flexible with that and really, um, yeah, go on with whatever they need, but, but definitely be able to, to have those options both combined or separate. So I'm wondering if that is also the difference between getting the degree in a school of music as opposed to getting a degree in, you know, in, you know, under the scope of a clinic, more of a clinical, um, I'm not sure what I'm trying to say, just a, a clinical profession. Like you're under, like Mike, you said you were under a school of nursing. So it's a little bit, probably the maybe even the coursework is a little bit different. And on top of the fact that there is a difference between undergrad, which says you got for in music therapy and Mike, you got graduate, you got a master's degree in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about half of my classes at Drexel were with just our group of 10 music therapy students. 
Um, and then the other half were combined with art therapy students and dance movement therapy students. Mm -hmm. There were about 40 of us total. Mm -hmm. And that was where we learned about um, uh, things like clinical diagnosis, mm -hmm. um, sort of principles of creativity and creative mm -hmm. thought, mm -hmm. um, development, things, things that were more, more general. And I guess we're mm -hmm. on the, um, on the master's level, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I would agree that I also came into the field feeling like my musical connectivity was a lot stronger than my verbal connectivity with patients. And I, I continue to find that um, to be the case to some extent, um, preferring to lean on the music a lot more. Mm. Um, so I'm sure Jesse's learning a lot of very, very useful things, many of which um, maybe I've heard of, but but haven't really put into practice or haven't learned them to the extent that you'd be able to doing the full master's degree in uh, verbal counseling. Interesting. Great. Um, so, yeah. So um, do you... So you are looking for in the future, Tessie, to kind of be able to pull all of these things together. That's awesome. Yeah. That would be the ideal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would think that's the ideal too. That's really fantastic. Um, so let's uh, moving forward, like what would you say were your were or are your greatest resources um, or resource recommendations that you could offer? Um, I'm thinking that family and friends, I know that's one of the, the main things uh, that really got me through the program and continue to be an amazing resource, um, that connection, especially with my classmates. Um, and it was also a very small group of music therapy students that we saw each other grow up and, and, and struggle and succeed together through those four and a half years. So, mm -hmm. so that cohort model really becomes like sort of a family. And to this day, some of my friends from the program are still my very best friends. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely that connection with people was, was an incredible resource. Um, also supervisors and, and faculty. I mean, I had an amazing relationship with Mike as my supervisor. I grew so much from him. Like even, even now in counseling, a lot of my, my theoretical perspectives come from the work that we did with like music, uh, music centered and person centered music therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, like just, just being a sponge and soaking everything from supervisors and faculty was, was great. And in myself as a resource and just my determination. And I, I came into this just knowing that I had this, this passion and this goal and, and that I just had to get through it. And, and just like being so focused on, on the goal and why am I doing this and why am I being motivated and, and how am I going to be able to help so many people after? I think that was just um, a huge source of, of determination and motivation and, and push that even one thing got difficult that still being so clear about where I wanted to go mm -hmm. um, got me through it. So let's go to Mike first before I go to Max thing. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that my supports were so pronounced. I think Chessie hit a lot of the important ones. Um, just the being connected with the people that you're with every day, that, mm -hmm. that network of students. Right. Um, a, a lot of these programs are quite small, so mm -hmm. you're also taking courses from the same people over and over again. You get to know them really quite well, and, and um, especially in this therapeutic context. Um, sometimes it can be a new experience taking um, classes and being in an educational setting with mm -hmm therapists who are your teachers because you might ask a question and the answer you know the classic therapy thing is to put it back on the person who asks the question <laughs> so I might feel like I just don't understand the definition of this word 
And someone says, well, what do you think it means? And I would say, if I knew what it meant, I wouldn't have asked what it meant. That's really funny. Uh, that happened over and over again. Um, okay. but, but the, the upside of that is that these are people who are so experienced at supporting people mm -hmm. and understanding when someone in front of them is just not, um, feeling quite right just not mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. feeling like they're doing well enough and and mm -hmm. coming up with really um beautiful important moments especially mm -hmm. when you're in those um academic yeah. um crises you know they, yeah. it feels like the end of the world um when you just can't figure out yeah a really important thing yeah and um and having instructors there who who are first and foremost, really good at helping other people. Yeah. So everybody going to music therapy has a lot of hope that their professors <laughs> will not be like the worst ever. Um, so it's not, it's not perfect across the board, no, but that's the no. general trend. Well, I mean, they're people, so. Of course. Um, so before, before we wrap this up, I think it's important to note that in the United States, um, to become a music therapist, you have to be board certified. So there is a there is a test that you take for a national board certification. Now, in the U.S., there's also states. So each state has either ha does have a licensure or does not have a licensure to so a, a state licensure. So I wanted to kind of ask you, Chesie, does Venezuela have a board certification process for music therapy? It does, yeah, it does not. And, and music therapy is still not a, a very recognized or established profession. Okay. There is one master's music therapy program that actually was somebody that studied at Temple and then oh, moved back awesome. to Venezuela and studied it. Um, but yeah, so because it's not really established, we don't have any sort of licensing or certification. Okay. Process. So if you were to want to go back to Venezuela and practice the, the degree you're getting right now is probably what is going to help you even introduce any type of music therapy related interventions in a practice in a way that is recognizable. Probably, yeah, there's there's still a very big stigma about therapy in, okay. in Latin America. It's, it's slowly changing, but but talk therapy is still a little bit more familiar mm -hmm. um, than music therapy, so it's, it, okay. it's definitely a, a helpful way to introduce it. Which is so interesting to me because when I think of Latin cultures, I think of music <laughs> as like such a deep part of you know of just of life you know and how much like fantastic music has come out of latin countries and um you know it just seems like that that would be such a natural a natural way for people to accept means of help and coping yeah and and maybe in a way of like maybe community music therapy or things like that or like that you don't put the word therapy in it maybe people would be a little more Okay. More receptive, but but you're still right. It would be such a like if people were a little more receptive, it could be such an amazing and effective way to connect. Um, right. To, yeah. Yeah, I feel like it seems that you what your process and let's say I don't know what your future goals are, but if you were to go back to your country, you just you're you're kind of getting through the back door. You're kind of you're having to introduce it in such a covert, undercover manner. You know. <laughs> But um, yeah, so that is important to note that not all countries have a board certification in the United States. There is, a, you know, like I said, a national board. It's a certification board for music therapists. We also have um, a, a, a music therapy association, it's the American Music Therapy Association, or otherwise known as AMTA. Um, we will include both of those resources um, on our site. Um, so that you can click on to those. And we understand that not all countries have um, the same standardization of these of this profession, or maybe even other therapeutic professions if there's, you know, some kind of just not part of their of their culture. Um, but it doesn't mean that, you know, you can't study in the States and obviously take it back and however you can or uh, or find a job here as well. 
Um, do you have, before we go, either of you, do either of you have any advice for music therapy or for students who are looking at the field of music therapy, no matter where you live? Maybe Chesi for you for international students and Mike for you for the, for the good old US of A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking for international students. Um, definitely research the program and the place, like the city or, or town where that university is in. It's, it's very important, I think. Um, and, and I think also having, I mean, not that they have to have a set plan for their entire life, but I think just having uh, an idea of what their goals are long term mm -hmm. can really help. Um, I, I didn't know coming into the field that it was going to be so challenging to find full-time jobs after, for example. So if that's something that, that people are coming in with the idea of entering a career that is going to guarantee them a path to get, for example, a, a work visa. Or something like that um, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. might not be the best field or, or they might have to consider uh, yeah like working part-time catching jobs finding a different way to stay here legally not relying through through a music therapy job mm -hmm. um, or also if their plans is to return back home also thinking about it, the ways that that music therapy as you were saying is gonna be received in their country and um, for me I, I wasn't really sure what I was gonna do and then as I went on the program, I realized that it was more likely that I wanted to, to stay here and use those skills here um, in more feasible, feasible than, than going back to my country. So I think just having an idea of, of what happens after you get that degree is very important. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one other thing that I might add uh, for our domestic students, um, it, it might be worthwhile to um, envision yourself in the future as a music therapist, um, as a person who's um, maybe engaged as a sort of a business person. Um, I know a lot of music therapists who have, like myself, like Chessie, not found that full-time job mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, especially my friends who had cars, um, that looked like having um, a, a caseload of their own clients who they would drive to their homes and, and have mm -hmm. sessions with um, with anyone who was, who was living in that home and was looking for music therapy support. Um, and then maybe the next day they're in a, a part-time position at a center. And then the next day they're working with another agency driving out to see other clients. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, for for a lot of people, it might be more um, managing your your personal finances and business than you would expect to have to. Um, if what you envision is landing somewhere where there's a forty hour position waiting for you, and there's a big company that's going to take care of all of your, um, you know, withholding your taxes and and doing all those other things that that yeah. big organizations have the capacity to do, but um, you know. A lot of a lot of those positions for new therapists are with maybe a music therapist who decided to start their own small agency and and they happen to have a few days worth of uh, client requests that they don't have anyone to go see yet. Maybe you're right. that person to go see those clients, um, but this could be a very very small operation. Um, sometimes with you know it's 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 a person who's a music therapist probably who's running this and hopefully they're going to be supportive and understanding of of your work but not in every case um so maybe preparing to be an independent minded person to some extent um and to to be managing yourself as sort of a small business yeah so maybe even thinking of yourself as a self starter um that is, but I wonder sometimes, you know, really music therapy is just like, is in, in some ways, not anything like a music, another music job or profession, mm -hmm. but then also is everything like it because you kind of have to, you have to depend on some gigs for a little bit mm -hmm. until you, <laughs> until you either build, a lot of people go into starting their own private practice, which is, you know, so, um, so great in the fact that they are, you know, building something of their own, 
you know, and you have, if you have your own style, style and if you are a more a very creative person, which most, uh, you know, or not most, but well, yeah, most music therapists are very creative people, obviously. Um, and, and maybe even in that way, um, until that profession comes along or that institution or that organization that, you know, that's maybe a little bit more stable comes along. Um, if that's what you're looking for. If that's what you're looking for, right. Um, so yeah, those are really, both really good, valuable um, pieces of advice for people to think about before they go in um, to this profession, not to deter you, but just to know that, that those, are, those are some considerations. I think that's everything. Is there anything else that you want to add, either of you? No? no? I, don't think so. I just um, want to say, yeah, yeah, I just want to say that I'm, music therapy is such an amazing feeling and has allowed me to grow so much as a person um, that even though it has had a lot of challenges, especially as an, as an international student, I, I wouldn't have changed that for anything. That's awesome. Um, Samesies, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to just thank both of you so much for giving of your time, for offering um, your own stories and your expertise and your knowledge um, pretty much to the world. So um, just love, I'm going to add kind of your, where you both studied, add some resources about where you can hook up music therapy programs in the United States, the American Music Therapy Association and their certification board for music therapists. So signing off, you guys don't have to go anywhere yet, but signing off for the online world of learning. Thank you so much for being part of this.